Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Hello, my dear. It's Sasha here. We won the, the challenge this time. What a pleasure to be with you today. And we will invite you, of course, to ask whatever you wish, to be creative with the discussion, because we'd love to share deeply, as you have mentioned. Thank you. Thank you so much for hearing me. I knew you were already here, and I'm grateful to spend this time with you. I miss you so very much. Sasha, I want to start with the idea of the shamans, who are in many different countries here on the planet. And the shamans and the indigenous cultures, they've got these amazing practices, healing practices, and I believe that they are connected to the stars, that they're connected to beings from other cosmos, maybe dimensions. And can you talk about what shamans, earthly shamans that is, are able to access as far as the cosmos information and connection with extraterrestrials? Well, of course, that's quite a big topic. So we are going to we are going to just talk in little bite-sized pieces. The first thing, however, is that we are going to go back into ancient earth history. And we are speaking of what you would call prehistoric history of the human race. First and foremost, the first inkling of what you would call shamanism came from, which will be quite obvious, the connection with the earth. So the recognition of the cycles of the season, the recognition of the moon and the sun and the tides and all of that, you could say were perhaps some of the very first shamanistic practices that were very simplistic in nature. Now, the reason we bring this up is because the point is we want you to know that inherently human beings are connected to the unseen worlds. They are connected to nature and the tides and the flows of nature. This is your, this is part of who you are as a an extension of the earth in some ways. This is true of 99.99% of species that have an indigenous root on their world. So you, you have an indigenous root on your world, meaning that there was part of your people that were uh, evolving through time mixed with uh, different species on your world. But then you had the periods of time where your family from the stars came. So if we're talking about very, 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 very ancient prehistoric times, at that time, some of the beings who came to the earth would try to live among you in very subtle ways. And that's that's not as easy maybe as it sounds because we kind of stuck out like, like sore thumbs, but we would try to live amongst you in very peaceful ways whereby then you would be curious and you would come to us. And then even though we could not share a language at that time, we were able through, through, mimicking and demonstration, able, able to impart some of the uplifted shamanistic practices from what you your people had already learned from nature itself. So this time period, of course, is very, very ancient, and we don't want to dwell too much here, but we want you to see that the relationship 
between humans and nature and extraterrestrials is a very ancient one. And you know, there are cave drawings on your planet of prehistoric uh, people with UFOs or alien beings. So this is something that is actually natural to planets. If you look at it from the point of view of us as extraterrestrials, we consider it a sacred duty to visit and assist in non-harmful ways with the upliftment and the evolution of all species. Now, because evolution takes so long, this means that there are periods of time throughout prehistoric history where these visitations have happened. Okay, so we're going to fast forward now. And we're going to go to a more significant time. This would be a time period that we know you are well aware of because we have spoken to you about it before. But it is a time period that was approximately 13,000 years ago. This is a nexus point, if you will, in human evolution. To simplify the importance of this time period, we will simply say that evolution of consciousness mimics what you know on your planet to be seasons, meaning that there are time periods where consciousness is more asleep and you are more separated, even separated from nature. And there are periods of time that are more like spring and summer where consciousness blooms and you once again feel the connection with nature. So if we go to this period 13,000 years ago, that is the time that marked the beginning of your, what you might call fall into winter cycle or the beginnings of fall and winter cycle where consciousness begins preparing for slumber in some ways. Now, from the point of view of extraterrestrials, when a planet goes into that period, we make ourselves available for, you might call it a final push. And we don't mean this in, a, in, a, in an aggressive way, but simply what we mean by that is that those who are awakened at that time, we work with intensively for thousands of years before you fall into the sleep cycle and we give you knowledge and we, we help you to uplift your consciousness so that as your planet begins to go into a sleep cycle, then those seeds get planted within you and the seeds Maybe you, you touch them here and there during the sleep cycle, but they start to blossom once again when you enter the spring and summer cycle, which is where you are now. So what does this have to do with shamanism? Our definition of shamanism might depend upon the period of time in which it's practiced. So if you look at what is known to be shamanism during times of awakening, shamanism is a natural expression of the connection to the earth and the cosmos, where you do not see or feel a separation between you, and therefore the universe, the cosmos, the earth, in a sense, channel through you and you are one with them. Shamanism would be considered different in another part of the cycle. So during a sleep cycle, for example, when you are already feeling separated from the universe, the earth and the cosmos, and you begin to go into that more visceral human experience filled with its fears and its judgments and its polarization. Shamanism is a practice that for those who are open to it can help you to remember your natural connection to the cosmos and to the earth. So 
in the last 13,000 years then, the practices of shamanism were mostly for the purpose of helping you to remember who you are, helping you to continue to feel that connection with the earth and the cosmos so that your sleep does not get too deep, so to speak. Here we are now, 13,000 years ago from that time where you went to sleep, and now it is spring. And so many of you are reconnecting with your shamanistic roots, not because the practices themselves are the future, but because the practices themselves are a vehicle to help you remember who you are and help you become your natural selves living with natural balance in the cosmos. So you're going to find then as you move more into this awakening cycle that we call fourth density, that shamanism will become less of a practice and more of a natural expression. Now, of course, when we when we talk about evolution, we evolution takes a long time. So we're really shortening the timeline here, but you're already seeing it now because so many of you are feeling the connection to shamanism in a way in which it's not like a religion, but it's more like a natural expression of who you are, that you are finally letting out. Do you understand what we mean? Very much so. Yes. Now, does this, uh, there were lots of components to your question. So do, is there something we missed? Yes, I, thank you. And that was beautifully fleshed out. And today, with the current shamans on the planet, what is their connection? Give me specific races, uh, extraterrestrial races that they, they connect with. What are they connecting about? And maybe there's even other dimensions. Ah, okay. If we go back then, to this period of time, we would say 13 to 15,000 years ago, the beings who were primarily your extraterrestrial teachers and mentors were from races connected with what we would call the families of Sirius and the families of the Pleiades. Those are two of the main uh, lineages, let's say, that have continued with your training, not just in a shamanistic way, but in training you to stay connected to your star lineages. Now, if we look at these two lineages of Pleiades and Sirius, those represent the more contemporary races of even older lineages, but we're not going to go into the older, older ones. So we're going to just package it into Pleiades and Sirius. You're going to find the Sirius beings, such as the being that you love so much, Hamon, represents the Yang energy or the masculine energy. And the Pleiadian energy perhaps represented by myself, represents more of the feminine energy. Because you live in a dualistic reality, the, the principles of male, female, dark and light and all of that are very importantly interwoven into your reality. So when we would do interactions with you in those ancient days, you would find schools maybe that were more Pleiadian in flavor, that were more feminine in expression, and schools that were more masculine in expression usually came from the Syrian lineages. But of course, you know, we don't want to divide it. There, there's overlays and bleed throughs. Today, now, those two lineages are awakening once again. And how they are showing up now in current time 
Let's look at the Pleiadian first. How the Pleiadian or the feminine star lineage is showing up in this period of time where you are awakening into spring once again is that it is working with the activation of the heart energy. The feminine energy of nurturing, of acceptance, of integration, of compassion. And of course, when we say those words, the first thought might be that we're talking about love and compassion for those out there. But we have to also say, as you well know, it has to do with the love and compassion for yourself. Because the last 13,000 years where you have lived as in a way that in which you felt like separated fragments abandoned by God and the universe, there has been a lot of self-judgment that you've heaped upon yourselves because somehow you were led to believe it's your fault that you were separated. There was not the understanding that it is just the cycles of evolution. And so that's one of the layers now the Pleiadian energy is working with you on having to do with the healing of those old wounds of self-judgment and guilt and learning love and compassion for yourself, which then flows out, of course, into your reality as well. And if we are to look at how the Syrian energy or the masculine energy is playing out or showing up in this time period now as you're entering the awakening cycle, is that you are being invited to develop a new relationship with how you move through reality, meaning third density or the old separation. You often moved through reality in a competitive, polarized, or controlling way. This is very much solar plexus energy. It's survival energy. You know, you say survival of the fittest and all of that. And you came to believe that that was what power was. But now the masculine Syrian energy is teaching you what true power really is. And it has nothing to do with manipulating the outer reality and everything to do with going inward and navigating your own infinite possibilities and your own infinite consciousness. And so you can see then how the Pleiadian and Syrian archetypes work together because one cannot go in to navigate within themselves, especially in their, in their wounds, unless they can heal the parts of themselves that have been in pain. So the healing, the Pleiadian energy is assisting that healing process so that you can begin to go in and discover your own definition, a new definition of what power really means, which has nothing to do with force or manipulating the external world. Now, your question was a large one. And this is what came out. So would you like to go in another direction or focus it in some way? Thank you. Yes. I'm going to make a shift here. And I think this will all, as we keep going, tie back together, <clears throat> woven. I want to talk about first contact. Now, you and I know very well that throughout our entire history, there has been extraterrestrial and earthly contact. I just want to acknowledge that. And I also want to acknowledge that we are not really earth beings. We're an amalgam of many different star systems and beings from the cosmos. So knowing that what I'm specifically talking about is I am hearing that there is going to be open first contact, true extraterrestrial contact in the sense that nobody will be able to deny it or bury it any longer. And if you deem that that is correct, could you give a guesstimation when that might happen? 
and which races we might start engaging with first. Well, you're going to uh, be angry with us, my dear, for saying this. Of course, someday this is going to happen, yes. But we have to say from our point of view, even though we have a, an, a, a plan, let's say, about steps, it's never on a fixed timeline. It always has to do with how consciousness responds to the previous step. So you've seen in your reality that there's been a, a little bit of a shift with information, let's say, leaking out in a matter-of-fact way. And then when that kind of information hits the mass consciousness, it creates frequencies, wavelengths, ripples, if you will, in the mass consciousness. And when the energy frequency of your mass consciousness reaches a certain level, that it's the next step naturally happens. And that is how contact has been done for millennia, actually, not even just on your world. So we cannot in that sense say when, and we know people are giving timelines and all of that, but it's much more fluid, which we know really aggravates your people <laughs> because they want details. But since we have done this for millennia, with very many civilizations, we know what happens when it is rushed and it cannot be rushed. So therefore, you might be asking or your listeners might be asking, well, what can I do as an individual maybe to speed it up? We understand the spirit of the question. You can't necessarily speed it up, but you can assist in the flow. You can assist in the frequency through your own individual contact work combined with the healing of whatever wounds have kept you stuck in this life. Those two items work together. Contact is not separate from that, but it has to do with a greater unfoldment on your world. We have to say that this might be a po an unpopular statement, but the experience of COVID on your world was an invitation. It was an invitation for your people to go within and to do this work. You've heard perhaps other civilizations like Esasani have had periods of their awakening where they they had types of isolation. And in that types of isolation, they then uh, awakened themselves. So COVID was, we don't want to say it's a test. It wasn't a test given to you by an outside source. But in the eyes of the universe, we could say it was a test. Would you go within and would you do the necessary inner work within yourselves as a people and come together as a people. As of right now, we can't say that that has happened, but the pot has been shaken. So things are in progress, but until that idea of healing the self, so one is not projecting their wounds into reality, once, as long as that is not um, dealt with, the contact issue is going to be very, very difficult. Now, in terms of who, if you could see how many beings there are of all stripes that are working in their own unique ways on this, you would probably be astounded. Of course, you know, there are those of us like myself who have been working through channeling for a very long time, but also working through direct contact work with groups in the field. That kind of work will continue. In general, you're going to find the species that 
you will interact with more and more physically or directly will be species that are somewhat like you. So Pleiadians, uh, hybrids, hybrid beings, maybe... Uh, Yael and Gael? Yes, the Yael, the Essesani, of course, and um, Syrian beings. Also, yes, though, they're a little bit more in the background, the Pleiadians, we Pleiadians push to the front of the line, so to speak. But they are there too. But basically, it's going to be as it has always been, species that have a connection to you, that somewhat look like you, and also with because you will recognize their frequency literally in your DNA from the ancient days. Amazing. I'm so curious when you say about us working on ourselves, that seems actually to be the answer to so many things it always comes back to self and cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. So in regards to the contact and being in a position, keeping up the contact work, but also working on our own wounds, it seems to me to be this incredible ongoing process. I'm somebody, I think I've done an enormous amount of work on self throughout my life, and I'm super grateful for the results. I'm also, extremely conscious that there's still so much more and more is revealed when it's revealed. How healed do we actually need to be for this to open up for us? Let us be really clear about this. You do not have to be squeaky clean. You do not have to be perfect because it might be a shocker, but any of us in a body still have things we're working on. So it's it has more to do with what wounds stop you from expressing your true self or what wounds keep you wanting to create separation from those around you through division etc those are the type those are the core wounds that will slow down the contact process. When you become, each of you as individuals become aware of these individual wounds you, and you see yourselves completely naked with love and honoring of those wounds as your teacher and real sincerity instead of bypassing, yes? That's the turning point. And now we take the full circle and we go back to shamanism because shamanism is helping you get to those core wounds so that you can see them. That's where the connection is between shamanism and contact. That is so true. Wow. I have found the shamanistic practice to be mind blowing in a way in its simplicity of practice and in its enormity of the return of, of investment of looking at oneself or giving oneself to a practitioner, a, a shaman to have work on you or when I work on somebody, I think it's a phenomenal and very deep, beautiful healing journey. I concur with what you just said. So now you can see, well, you probably saw it already, but when we would be doing the work with you at the retreats, especially Hamon, why he had to sometimes talk about the darkness and the shadow. It was his way of activating that alchemical energy of the dark and light within you so you could begin this process of healing within yourself which then brings you to the next phase of contact hmm. sasha are there any et races that you're aware of that are shamanic in nature or practice this will surprise you my dear 
most of us are. But when we come to you and communicate, we, at least as you have been in the last 13,000 years, or we could say even in the last 100 years, very focused on the mind. So right now, many of us give you information to stimulate your minds and we slip in the shamanistic practices. But that is actually not who we are. We are more shamanistic in our natural selves and less mental. So we're you're not yet seeing who we really are, but in the beautiful times when we do meet in person and we are able to sit together in a circle, you will see that the shamanism is natural for us. Just like I have described previously that when you enter fourth density, it doesn't become a practice or a religion. It is just how you express the universe through you. And so your beingness that is very shamanic in nature, it starts with your connection to the to nature, to your planet. And what else, how else do you express that practice or beingness? Can you describe it a little more? Well, very often when, when we feel an energy building inside of us, it's usually a time maybe when we're resisting something or there's something we need to learn to bring us to the next level. Those are the time periods where we utilize nature. And this is something I have spoken about many times in the past, but it's a it, it is typically a Pleiadian practice. But when we are ready to make some type of big shift in consciousness, we tend to go to a planet and we remove our clothes, we remove everything, and we wander in the nature until we know the walkabout is finished. And that walkabout brings about the integration that we needed at that time for the next level. We do also very many ceremonies. We have tried sometimes in workshops to simulate some of those ceremonies with you. But of course, the simulation is never as impactful as the, the real-time experience, but we're bringing it in little by little. So that, that's an example for us. It is, nature is the place, if you will, where your nakedness is needed. You meaning you for us to walk in nature without nakedness is shutting off the flow of energy. And when I say nakedness, the physical nakedness is symbolic. It's the inner nakedness that we are speaking about. So when you go into nature, you have to be naked in that way. And we choose to do it both physically as a symbol and um, energetically as well. Mm -hmm. It's very moving. I want to talk a little bit about time travel and practical applications. So in your civilization, your Pleiadian civilization currently, do you use time travel for historical research or exploration? How do you utilize it? For what? This is a very challenging question because the language in which we are speaking is grounded to gravity and to a time continuum. And our reality is less grounded in that way. 
So we're going to give you a couple of ideas here. One is that from our point of view, and you've heard this before, but we're talking about this on a visceral level, past, present, and future don't exist. The current moment is the only thing that exists. And as humans evolve their consciousness enough to be able to travel through space, then you will learn this truth. And it changes the way you view reality and the way you view time travel 100%. So the question then is, how do we have any interest in it? There are people in our civilization who are historians, just like you have. And those are primarily the people that might, you would say, formally do time travel. But while humans might think of it as this exciting thing that you have in, in uh, science fiction movies, from our point of view, it's as exciting as going to the convenience store. <laughs> Meaning that it's an option, but when the mind isn't driving you in reality, then the motivation for that is not there in the same way. The historians are the nerds, and of course, they want to study that, and that is perfectly fine. But then the question becomes, if all time is now, and there are infinite possibilities, what timeline are you going to explore? Because every historical event will have a timeline with a slight change to it. So in that sense, then you can't go back in time to find out who stole the crystal from the temple because there's infinite timelines in which the answer to that question is different. This is why in our reality, we don't pursue those types of thought lines because our minds don't operate that way anymore in a fixed way. You instead have a recognition of all options, all realities being one, and the one you need to connect with is the one that, that you connect with in an organic way. It happens through you and it gives you a gift to you. And that's how we see it. Does this make sense, my dear? It does. Absolutely, it does. And I'm also trying to wrap my brain around what it's like to be you without separation from different dimensions and multidimensionality and different timelines. It, it's a lot to conceive. I can conceive of it intellectually but experientially to understand that I'm here right now in this moment, I am with you a hundred percent. And what if the doorbell rang and I made a different choice or I chose to stay with you? Well, two different timelines were just created. And that's a really minute example, but in every moment we're creating choice, choice, choice. And how does one understand that there's a me over here there's a me right here, there's a me over there, and where they all end up. Uh, do they have uh, synchronicity or synergy together? And how do you manage all of that information or idea? It matters not to us. Because when you are worrying about what's happening on all the other timelines, then you are not here. When you are here, here is all that exists in the now, and you flow from one to another. Let's let's try to make it less complicated. <laughs> Maybe that, that won't happen, but think of it as frequency and flow. Even though the universe is open to us, dimensions and, and all of that, there are frequencies in which we're not compatible, so we're not pulled there. 
So it's not like it's a it's a smorgasbord that we can go in and and have anything on any dimension. It's all frequency. It's all flow. And actually, that's what your reality is, too, as well in this life. But you have so many distractions that you don't see that yet. So if it's frequency and if it's flow, then you are always moving toward the frequency that is compatible to you in any given moment. So if if we are sitting here talking with you right now and the doorbell rings, yes, there's a Debbie that goes and answers the door and there's a Debbie that ignores it. Which Debbie are you going to be? It's, It's not the... The the revealing of that, which Debbie is it, is not going to come by you thinking about it. It's actually going to come by what you organically do in the moment. You'll either organically get up and answer the door or you will organically stay here. And that's what we mean by frequency. When humankind stops thinking so much in the way you've Come become accustomed to think, you are going to have brought your energy, your consciousness in a consolidated, integrated way into your field in the here and now. And it is a totally different way to experience reality. Hmm. Do shamans experience time travel? Do they go to other timelines? Uh, Are you speaking of shamans, human shamans, or? Yes, thank you. Human shamans, yes. Well, it has to be different for each shaman. At least in an overall sense on your world, in third density where you've been the last 13,000 years, in frequency, most of that type of time travel has been done through consciousness. There have been instances where shamans have, in a sense, gone through dimensional doorways and things such as that. It's really different depending on the person, their practice. If they have any wounds that are anchoring them, it's the same issue with contact. Can you connect with the entity known as Mother Earth, Madre Tierra or Pachamama? And if you can connect with her, the Great Mother, what messages does the Great Mother have for us? What don't we know? She was very quick to tell me what she wanted to say. And it it's, might be something that people don't want to hear. But she says, relax, everything is perfect. And we understand what she means by that, but maybe we have to explain what she means by that. What she means by that is that if the universe is all wise, and if the universe is continually in balance, which it is, then even when it appears things are out of balance, there is always a larger balance that is happening that is not seen. So when she says, relax, all is perfect, it does not mean don't do your work. It does not mean Uh, to pollute your waters. That's not what she means. She means that if all of you go into your hearts and your souls and and you do what is right and what is organic in how you live and how you grow the relationship to the earth, then you will be doing all that's necessary. So therefore, we go back to what was said before about what is stopping you from seeing the balance 
that Mother Earth is speaking of. And it has to do once again with the individual wounds that are unhealed. Because when the individual wounds are unhealed, everything you see in reality around you will be a reflection of that wound. And therefore, it would be impossible to see healing, to see good, if you can't first experience it within yourself. So that is her message. And what about the cosmos? If you can connect with it as though it was an entity, what kind of song would it sing to the people here on earth? What would it want us to know that we do not currently know? We sense laughter, and it is not meant with disrespect. It is meant to say, ha, 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 you still don't recognize that we are all one. Ha, 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 but you will. And the ha, ha, ha is kind of how maybe a mother would laugh at a child that in, in with love that doesn't yet understand something fundamental. But that understanding is coming. That is also one of the reasons why there is so much resistance and polarization on your world because the old energies don't wanna change. They're scared and they're trying to stop it from happening, so to speak. But the truth of your being that there is really only one consciousness in creation looking through many eyes, that truth is rapidly approaching in the forefront of your consciousness. How beautiful and how hopeful. I wanna ask you about plants and plant medicine. Uh, I'm wondering, how the shamans would know out of the thousands of plants, which to use, which two plants to mix together to use I, to create ayahuasca. Regarding consciousness, healing, visionary experiences, ayahuasca, DMT, LSD, mushrooms, etc. Were the shamans originally gifted this information by extraterrestrials? Where did it come from? How did they know? We would say that ancient, ancient, ancient days, prehistoric days, it was a lot of trial and error, such as, oh, this mushroom looks delicious, and then you eat it and you have a trip, yes. So, or you eat it and you die if it's a poisonous mushroom. So a lot of that in the very ancient days was trial and error. However, depending upon the period of time in your evolution, those periods of time when the extraterrestrials were here and they were mentoring you, some of that wisdom was refined, let's say where more information was given, mixtures were given, etc. However, sad to say, sometimes recipes were not remembered through time. So you had to go back to trial and error again. However, we do have to say, and perhaps you've, you've heard us say this before, that the sacred plant medicine is really only meant to use during temporary periods. It's usually used during temporary periods of uh, transition, when you are going through, when you're trying to, in a sense, break through to get to another level of consciousness. When you get to a point, for example, um, fourth density beings, in my reality, rarely use those types of plants because we can already do it on our own. So there's no need to. So it is a tool that is very useful. And depending upon the period of time in history, there's an overall reason for it. Right now, the reason is 
the healing of the wounds. But there have been other times in history where it wasn't used for that. It was used to remember yourself as the one, for example. Hmm. I, I don't know if you can feel me. <laughs> I want to riff off of what you just said. Since you can naturally achieve these states, I recently, for the very first time, experimented with ketamine, something I've been fascinated with and very grateful that I did it. And my experience was transcendent. I don't know that I have English words, language words to articulate what it was like. For those 40 minutes, um, when I reflect back on it, I feel like I was pure consciousness, pure awareness. I had no sense of body or what was breathing this body or being in a body. And I do recollect moments of seeing just the most phenomenal sacred geometry and things unfolding. I just don't know how to express what it was. Do you have any sense when I talk to you about it of connecting with me, what that experience is and how you might typify it. Yes, the description was very good, but also we could we could feel you and, and kind of sense your memories of the experience. And it's kind of funny that you will ask how to put words to it when it's a kind of experience that you really can't put words to. But simply we would say it was another, it was offering you another level to an experiential opportunity to know who you are beyond the physical. And then somehow bring a memory of it back that can be anchored in your cells so that you can feel it and remember it. It's like an entrainment of frequency so that you can eventually, this life or another life, who knows, be able to retrace your steps on your own, under your own steam, so to speak. Sasha, can you share any information about your own society's approach to interstellar diplomacy and contact with emerging civilizations? Oh my goodness, that's a big topic. Well, let's if, let's first talk about interstellar diplomacy because our version of diplomacy is very different than the definition you have on Earth. The definition on Earth usually has to do with two differing civilizations and their conflicts and how to how to somehow get to middle ground between you, how to perhaps resolve a dispute. But for us, this is something a lot of people on your world do not understand and do not want to accept because there's all sorts of stories out there. But interstellar species, to, to be an interstellar species, you have to have a certain level of consciousness in order to be able to live and sustain reality outside the gravitational field of a planet. And that means there's not... E.T. pirates and negatives running around, making war. That's not how it is in our reality. That is a projection of understanding by where you are on Earth now. But even that will eventually dissolve when you see the truth of yourself and then apply it to the universe. Therefore, for diplomacy, our version of diplomacy would be more akin to, ah, uh, that species over there is more different than us. It's so exciting. Let's connect and learn from each other. 
So to us, that is diplomacy. And there are some beings maybe that are like hermits and don't want to mix. And that's okay. We let them be. There are other beings that are, can't wait to enter the galactic community. And we assist them and help them get to a point where they shift their consciousness enough to make that possible. That's what we are working with with you now. The only thing stopping your world is the state of consciousness that is still fra um, fractioned and polarized. That's the main thing. Is there anything while we do contact work, mindful contact work here on this planet, maybe we gather friends together, we go out to Joshua Tree or some other site, and we start to engage in invitation for contact. Is there anything specific that we can do that would encourage benevolent contact? We think probably you know the answer to this, but being in your heart is the most important thing. Now we know that sounds in your language very airy fairy. What does that mean, be in your heart? Well, we'll give you a little training wheel that you can use. When you're out sitting there with your friends under the desert sky, think of a time in your life where you felt so loved. It could be as a baby being held by your mom, it could be when your dog looks up at you with those beautiful eyes. And when you find that moment, stay in that moment. That is the frequency we see. That is the frequency, in a sense, you could say that pulls us in. To continue with this, we have to give the suggestion that each person doing contact work really examine their definition of what contact means for them. Because sometimes the definition might be, we don't mean any disrespect when we say this, but the definition might be more egoic, meaning I want to see the ship. I want to shake their hands. I, 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 the ego wants it so that the ego can then believe. But the irony is the ego will never believe. So there's another part of you then that has to be the one driving the contact. So once again, we go back to the idea of know thyself, know your wounds, know your motivations. And if you can get to a point where you know yourself well enough, then you can consciously take yourself to that place of love we were just talking about and rest there and then allow the contact to naturally develop from there. Because the human ego thinks, will always think it has to do something. When in reality, it has to stop doing and be naked and open and allowing for the experience. And it's a process. So you cannot rush it. So why not enjoy it? Be there in the love. In conclusion, take us home, Sasha, on the subject of shamans, on the subject of time travel, extraterrestrial civilizations and beings and contact and open contact and all of that. Can you give us some conclusion here, something you'd like us to know? Thank you for the invitation. It is often very difficult for us to choose one thing. So we're going to choose the most important thing in our eyes, 
that we hinted at before. And we want you to remember, even if you can't remember with your mind, you can remember with your consciousness. Remember back far, 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 as far as you can go when there was only one consciousness. And that one consciousness had no eyes, no arms, no legs. It simply was just one. And in order to enrich itself and to have experience, it, you could say, created the illusion of fragmentation or created multitudes of eyes and hands and legs so that it could experience creation in all its possibilities. And remember that even when you are in this body with the eyes of the universe and the hands of the universe, that that one consciousness has not gone away. It is still the consciousness that is seeing reality through your eyes. And if you can remember that and hold that wisdom within you, you will feel the great love of your being and you will know the truth beyond the mind. And this alone can transform a planet. This is what we are assisting with you now, assisting you with now, and many, many other beings are assisting you as well. You're very, very close. Keep going and know that your family from the stars is forever embracing you with much love.